Ja, meine Damen und Herren, äh, ich soll einfach anfangen, das tue ich dann auch. Äh, ich beginne ganz kurz auf Deutsch, begrüße Sie recht herzlich im Namen des äh, Vorstands der friedrich Naumann stiftung Mein Name ist Wolf-Dieter Zumfort, ich bin der stellvertretende Vorsitzende der Stiftung. Ich begrüße Sie recht herzlich zum heutigen Seminar. Und äh, I just want to uh, change uh, into English because uh, some of our guests and uh, speakers are not able to speak German, so I will continue in English and hope you are uh, enjoyed about my good English. <laughs> in the sense that uh, I will try my best. Uh, first of all, um, I welcome you at the headquarter of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. I'm very happy that you found your way here to Potsdam. My name is of course Wolf-Dieter Zumfort. I'm the vice chair of the board of directors of the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, Stiftung or the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. And I especially welcome the speakers of today's uh, colloquium. Some of them have really uh, had a long travel from the United States, from England and from Bodensee and so on. And let me tell uh, you also that uh, Mr. Detmar, Dr. Detmar During, the head of the Liberal Institute, sends you his warm regards and is truly sorry that he cannot be here today. You might uh, have noted that this house is quite a historical one on a quite historic place. I just told to our guest where we are now. During the Potsdam Conference, following the Second World War, the American President Truman has resided here for a couple of days in other houses, the Stalin House and other houses. It means they were here to uh, have the so-called Potsdam Conference and to discuss the results of uh, the Second World War and to rebuild uh, a new uh, yeah, society uh, in Germany on a democratic basis. Originally, it was white. It was called the Little White House. And during the GDR time, it was right next to the border, since West Berlin, which is just on the other side of the lake, uh, belonged to West Germany, and Potsdam belonged to East Germany. And for all the, uh, these who don't know, just on this way here, there st was, was standing the wall. So we are on a very historical uh, place here. Interestingly, uh, it's a, a new fictional book that was just awarded with the German Book Prize, placed partly here in this house during the 1960s, when the school was installed in this building. For all the German, probably you have uh, noticed that Eugen Ruge in Zeiten des Abnehmenden Lichts den Deutschen, den Deutschen Buchpreis bekommen hat. Und ein Teil seiner Geschichte spielt genau hier, weil es früher eine Schule war. The Friedrich Nama Foundation for Freedom has resided here since 2001, and apart from the chimney, everything you see here is new and not original because there was a fire and everything was destroyed. But this chimney is the original one there. Now to our uh, seminar. I told this the only original, and speaking of originals, that brings us to the topic of our today's colloquium. The Liberal Institute has been dealing with the topic of property for quite some time now. Actually, property has been one of the focal issues of the foundation's work for the last three years, which we, the board, have installed in uh, this foundation. This year, the focus has been put on in inte intellectual property rights. This issue is first a complex one, and second, it is not without ambiguity and for liberals. Let me tell where my experience from, from uh, intellectual property rights stems from. I'm working for now 20 years for um, a big German company called TUI, in former times called Poisac, and I'm working in the fields of uh, World Trade Organization. And you know probably the World Trade Organization is dealing since the year 1995 with four topics. The first are uh, general, agreement, uh, general agreement on trade and tariffs for goods. Then second is general agreement for trade and services and for services. Then this, this uh, third is trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. And the last one is dispute settlement unit. That means since the year of 1995, in the <coughs> trade world trade agenda, intellectual property rights have. Uh, 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 um, um, isolated pillar and all the discussions in the last years mostly are focused on intellectual property rights. To say it uh, 
out of my experience. I was working on um, um, services uh, liberation in China and we got it when China stepped into the World Trade Organization in the year 2001 that we could direct our, our company to uh, uh, tourism company in China with more than 50 percent. We can go uh, to the Chinese wall with a TUI uh, flag and in TUI buses and in TUI uh, hotels, which was not possible in the years before. That's one of the former times. That means, uh, that means uh, uh, the, the first 10 years of my uh, working at the WTO was working with uh, freedom for services. But now, when our Chancellor, Ms. Merkel, is, uh, going, is uh, on a, a trip to China, he has um, so-called um, uh, oh, what? What is it? They have. Uh, they will have a paper from the German industry in their baggage, which told of the problems with China in the fields of intellectual property rights. Because we can now uh, uh, export nearly everything to China. We can do nearly every services in China. But you know that uh, all the problems in China arose from the the uh, negative protection of intellectual property rights there. For instance, we as a former company of Poisac built up a crane uh, a factory in China uh, in the years 98, 99. Two years later, a second similar crane factory was rented by the Chinese, and they were a little bit cheaper, so we have to lock up our crane factory, and that is one kind of, uh, uh, um, uh, of you yeah. know, not protected intellectual property rights because they learned from us how to build trains in the fields of the container. So let me go back to my my paper here. Imagine somebody owns a broccoli, not just literally, but the conception of broccoli. It's genetic code. Everybody who wants to breed new varieties to or plant or sell broccoli not only would have to buy the seeds but also would own to the holders of a royalty. Would this be good for gardening to for additional incentives to breed vegetables and to have registered new species came up? Or would this be bad for other breeders and customers because of fewer choices and thus higher prices of seeds and production? Have you ever asked such questions? Not many people think about processing vegetables, but the protection of ideas and bootlegs, illegal file sharings and patent wars are on everyone's lips. Even among classical liberals, the principle of intellectual property rights and the patent and the copyright law are controversial topics. On the one hand, there are some protagonists of stern protection of immaterial goods and ideas. On the other hand, some classical liberals oppose intellectual mono monopolies. Some commentators accentuate similarities to the benefits of protecting private property rights for innovation and the efficiency of resource allocation. They fear that a world without intellectual property as a socialist nightmare. In opposition, other experts warn against monopolization and reduce incentives for innovations. To this day, there is a dispute about the historical role of intellectual property rights. And now to the end of this colloquium and uh, to the end. With our colloquium today, the Liberal Institute at the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom wants to initiate a discussion about the liberal perspective on the, of intellectual property rights. What are the arguments for more or for less protection of intellectual property rights? What are the consequences of the different positions? Might there be a common liberal position? That's the task, that's the, the, what we have to do to give answers to this question. We hope that an exchange of ideas about the history of intellectual property rights and some empirical aspects of copyrights and patents in our daily life will help to find some answers to these questions. You are highly welcome to bring your arguments into the discussions. I wish us an interesting and lively event, and I am looking forward to the talks and to the debates. Thank you very much. I think now to say exactly, there are two people uh, who are ruling the, the discussions.
Hatvani, Research Fellow at the Lowell Institute, who is there, and the second is Mr. Stephen Heinrich, Research Fellow also at the Liberal Institute. I give over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, a happy welcome from our set of 12. Stephen and I will guide you through this day, so if you have any questions, just let us know. Uh, we're very happy that you are here. It's a very interesting topic, a very fun topic. Unfortunately, I already have bad news for you. Um, the boardroom got ill two days ago, and um, he told us yesterday afternoon that he was not able to get on the plane, so we're very, very sorry that he will not be able to join us here. Um, but we have two very fine experts who know Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Baldwin's book, and we just printed it out. <laughs> and uh, Professor Killian, Professor Littlebits, um, said that they will give jointly a talk on Baldwin's arguments. So we will have to try to, to improvise here, but we are very, very thankful that uh, we get so, so nice and so strong to speak with them. Um, so now let me present you Professor Kulia. I'm very honored that he is here. He's from the University of Buckingham, as far as I know, the only private university of Great Britain. Um, you might be surprised that he's actually a clinical biochemist. He initially trained medicine at Bart's Hospital Medical School in London. He then specialized in clinical biochemistry and studied for his doctorate at Oxford University. After years of researching and lecturing in Newcastle, Fontana, and Cambridge, he became Vice Chancellor at the University of Buckingham. He is well known for his outspoken opposition to public funding of science, so we're very happy that uh, he came to us. I don't know if he knows that we are publicly funded. Why do you read books in sex science and profits, how people evolve to make money? I unfortunately don't have it here to show it here. I've forgotten my office, but I will show it to you in From 2008, he argues that contrary to general belief, governments need not fund science. He states that science and science is not a public good, but rather is organized in colleges. Um, this is why government funding is actually I'm sure we'll say a bit of these arguments during his talks also, and I'm um, curious if his arguments are only true for a bitter system or can only or also be applied for a, for a German system as well. But in the first place, he will give us an insight into our mutual interest to property rights, and uh, we will have an episode of funding and then for, um, for a holy land. Do I switch here or stand here? As you like. Um. Which is the better? Which is the which would the audience prefer? Standing, please. Standing, The microphone. I, I, I couldn't. I can't hear. Okay. What? The watch. I'll just wind behind. Just oh, you get it back. Yeah, yeah you get it back. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in private. <laughs> Thank you very much for having invited me. Can you hear me at the back? No, it's only for the camera. All right. That's all. So you may have to speak loud, please. Okay, I will speak loud. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I don't wish to offend this foundation at all, but my talk is dedicated to the memory of Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck was a very great man who did not believe in intellectual property rights. In particular, he believed that patents were a mistake, and he opposed them. And so since I am here in Germany today, I dedicate my talk to your great leader. I want to start with an interesting story. Many of you would have been to Washington in America, and many of you would have seen in the museum there, the Space Museum, the original Flyer One, the first powered aeroplane called Flyer One that the Wright brothers built. But I wonder if anybody in this room knows in which museum Flyer One has spent most of its life. There are two people here who I've met at previous conferences, and they're not allowed to answer this question. But I wonder if anyone who hasn't met me before would like to guess where Flyer One has spent most of its life. It has spent most of its life in the British Museum in London. 
So why was it that an American artifact, one of the most iconic of American artifacts, the world's first powered airplane, has spent most of its life in London and not in America? And the answer is a patent dispute. When the Wright brothers created the airplane, they patented it. They patented everything. They patented the propeller. They patented the steering. <coughs> they, they patented what we now call aerolons, though in those days they had a different way of doing it, of bending the wings. They patented everything. And whenever anybody else came along with a later invention, particularly an American called Glenn Curtis, the Wright brothers won in court and proved correctly that their patents were being violated. The problem was that they had invented the aeroplane with private money. They were uh, bicycle manufacturers in Dayton, Ohio, and they spent a thousand of their own dollars to develop the aeroplane. But unfortunately for them, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington had received a grant of $79,000 from the War Department in America to also build an aeroplane because the War Department was fighting a war in Cuba and thought it'd be nice to kill the Cubans by dropping bombs from them from an aeroplane rather than doing it on the ground. And so they tried to develop their own aeroplane with the Smithsonian, but it was the Wright brothers who got there first. So the Smithsonian, trying to defend future government grants, joined in with the American government to maintain against the facts, by the way, the Smithsonian told lies, they actually told lies, the most extraordinary story, to maintain that they had invented the aeroplane first. And so every time the Wright brothers went to court, on the other side was the Smithsonian and the American War Department lying that they had got there first with their own aerodrome. The result was this. American aviation stopped. Whenever anybody in America tried to fly the Wright brothers took them to court and won. But in the meantime, the Wright brothers had stopped developing aeroplanes because they spent their entire time in court. <laughs> there was no American aviation. And at the same time, the Wright brothers grew to hate the Smithsonian Institution, which was heartily reciprocated. So when finally Flyer One was redundant and the Wright brothers were looking for a museum in which to put it, they weren't going to give it to the Smithsonian or indeed any other American museum. So in the end, they went to that center of rational and reason and calmness, England, and they gave it to the British Museum. And the Smithsonian only asked for it back <coughs> after the last Wright brother had died, because they did not want to give the Wright brothers the satisfaction of recognizing that, yes, actually, it's Wright brothers who got there first. If you go to the Smithsonian today, you will find a totally dishonest entire exhibition. There's a whole set of rooms dedicated to fly away and a whole series of panels and stories which are dishonest. They say things like, the poor Wright brothers died young because of the stress of litigation, never explaining who was actually the stressor in these litigations themselves, <laughs> their own museum. But this is a government-funded enterprise, so of course. So the point is that only in 1917, when the First World War broke out, that America suddenly realized that Germany had an excellent air force, Britain had an excellent air force, the French had an excellent air force, even the Turks had a good air force, but the Americans had no air force worth speaking of. And so Roosevelt, who then of course eventually became the president before Truman, when he was Assistant Secretary of State for the Navy, he enforced compulsorily a patent pool in aviation in America. And between 1917 and 1975, there were effectively no patents in American aviation. I mean, technically, you wrote a patent, and technically you filed a patent, but you could not in any way stop other aviation manufacturers from using the information you disclosed. So the American aviation between 1917 and 1975, in a compulsory patent pool, flourished. Patents between 1903 and 1917 in America, no aviation. 1917 to 1975, no patents, best aviation industry in the world. Now that is an interesting empirical fact. Let me tell you another interesting empirical fact, which brings us back to Otto von Bismarck. In the 19th century, there was such a vigorous debate 
and fight over patents, that two countries, Switzerland and the Netherlands, actually abolished patents. Well, the Swiss chose not to introduce a patent law at all. And uh, in 1850, they took a decision, we will not have a patent law. In 1868, the Dutch and the Netherlands, they took the decision to abolish their pre-existing patent laws. So they abolished patents in 1868. And between 1850, 1868, and 1907, 1912, when they finally introduced patents, we have a very interesting experiment here in the heart of Europe. European countries like Germany had patents becoming more and more strong, incidentally, and countries like Switzerland and the Netherlands had no patents. We also have, through the work of the economic historians, very good data, because this is relatively recent, on rates of economic growth. Where rates of economic growth in Switzerland and the Netherlands increased or decreased by not having patents relative to the other countries of similar economic status? Answer, no effect at all. Not having a patent didn't stimulate economic growth and didn't damage economic growth. There's absolutely no deflection at all on the steady rate of growth that these two countries had relative to the German, the Belgian, the Norwegian, or the Danish. There is, therefore, no empirical evidence on a national level that patents stimulate, or indeed inhibit, economic growth, have any impact that is measurable. Moreover, from a story like the aeroplane, there's a lot of evidence that patents can do as much bad as good. So these are the stories with which I start. Now, Stan Leibovitz and I met last night, and we both agreed that although I'm talking on the, intellectual, on the history of intellectual property, patents and copyright are really very different. So I'm going to talk primarily on patents, because I know quite a lot about patents, and Stan is going to talk about copyright, because he knows an awful lot more than me about copyright, which is not difficult. Most people know more than I do about copyright. Um, and we will then, in the discussion afterwards, try to integrate this into a general history of intellectual property. But I, I personally believe that there's a very big difference between patents and copyrights. And although now the international conventions bring them all together, I think they are born of different disciplines and they have very different uh, frameworks. So I think it's good that Stan and I are going to talk essentially separately. Because this is the point about intellectual property, particularly patents. The concept is very simple. Someone makes an invention and a discovery. Surely it is only right that he or she can keep the benefits of that invention. If you invent something, an aeroplane, for example, and someone can come along and get it and, and borrow your, your intellectual property and copy it without the cost of invention and therefore undercut you like your crane factory in China. Well, surely under those circumstances, you're not going to invest in research and development. Why do research and development if others can steal your technology? And as the French say, particularly as a French argument, there's also a moral case here. If someone invents something, then morally, that belongs to that person. It's, it's a moral issue. Actually, in my opinion, this is not true. Uh, and I'll explain why not. But I'm going to start off by saying there are real distinctions between material property rights and intellectual property rights. For example, consider the difference between owning a piece of land and owning an idea. The fundamental words that economists use about public and private property are rivalrous, I'm sorry to use these words, the, the economists have terrible, everyone knows economists use terrible language, rivalry and excludability. Take this pen. This pen is by definition non-rivalrous. That's to say, if I use this pen, you can't use it. It's rivalrous. We would have to fight over it, like Cain and Abel. The idea of a pen is non-rivalrous. I can use the idea of a pen, and you can use the idea of a pen, and using the idea does not exhaust it. A million people could be making pens in their factories, and the idea of a pen is not exhausted. It is non-rivalrous. But the individual pen is rivalrous. So, 
This is potentially and easily a piece of private property. It's mine, and I'll fight you for it. <laughs> but the idea of a pen can be used by a million people, and it is not in any way depleted. And if you and I fight over the pen, and we break it, it's depleted. But fight over an idea is not depleted. So one of the concepts of the difference between private and public property is rivalry. Can it be owned by one person, or potentially can it be owned by millions without any detriment to, to the essence of the thing? And the other is excludability. When you have something like a piece of land, can you... Oh, sorry. Do you want to take questions during the talk or only at the end? Uh, from the rest of the audience, yes. From you, Stan, I'm not at all sure I want to take any questions at all, because you probably know <laughs> <laughs> because you'll know more than I do. But I, uh, what is your connection here? Um, I would suggest to let you speak to the end and yeah. then have a discussion. I'm just going to have a little sign to... <laughs> <laughs> can we just take Stan's question now? But, but no more. What were you going to say, Stan? What I was going to say is you can make your whole argument just on excludability. I'm just coming on to that. The, the non I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm non rivalist but excludability is irrelevant to the story you want to tell. You are, of course, right. I can't just say that Stan is right. But, but not everyone in this room knows what excludability is, so I'm going to go into it. <laughs> we had a great dinner last night. We got on very well last night. It may be a different story this morning. Um, excludability is the other thing, and Sam is quite right, but let me nonetheless talk about it. Excludability means that you can exclude others from using it. So, for example, if you have a piece of land, can you build a fence around it so that no one can go onto that piece of land? But well, obviously, you can. Can you exclude people from using ideas? Well, not so easily. And in patterns, as I'm going to come to, not at all, because science is a very different thing fr from land. But what I'm going to say here is this. Everyone understands that in land and in material objects like individual pens, you need property rights or you won't invest. If you own a farm and you own it, you will invest in that farm. If, on the other hand, it is common land, you have what is called the tragedy of the commons. It doesn't belong to everyone, to anyone, and so everyone exploits it and you get the tragedy of the commons. And so everyone understands that there has to be strong property rights in land. But no country gives absolute property rights even in land. Um, uh, and some of the restrictions on land are, 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 are actually much stronger than people realize. If you own a farm, you are not a sovereign nation. You only own that farm by virtue of the rights that the parliament give you. But those rights are not absolute. In many countries, for example, you do not own the mineral rights. It varies from country to country. But in principle, you generally don't own the mineral rights. It depends exactly what country you're living in. You certainly, wherever you live, don't own the aviation rights. You can own a piece of land, but you can't stop airplanes <laughs> flying over it. There are many other restrictions on the use of land. In Britain, for example, trespass is not seen as a serious crime. Because, you know, who says it's your land? God invented the land. You're only a custodian of the land. And so in Britain, trespass is not a crime. It's a, you know, the owner has the right to ask you to leave, but there are, in America, on the other hand, of course, you can just shoot people. Because you know, different countries have got different laws. Uh, but no country gives absolute property rights to anyone. And in England and in America, America has what's called eminent domain. In England, we have what's called compulsory purchase. The state always has the right to take your land from you in law, this is a right the state has that is over the your rights. I just heard the story from your deputy chairman about the strip of land by the water here, that in communist times, everyone had the right to go along the strip of land. This is the same in England, by the way. No individual in, in England can own a beach. You can own the land up to the sea, but as long as the sea has even a splash on that piece of land, it is always public property, and anyone can always walk along the boat coast all around the entire coast of England because we believe that no one should have the right, even though they own the land, to that. That should be common to everyone. And in communist times, that was the case by the sea here, but it's no longer the case under the current uh, constitution of your country, but this could change. So the point I try to make is that even property rights in land are not absolute. And indeed, as many of you will know, there are real discussions about eminent domain in America. There are now municipalities in America which compulsorily force uh, people to sell their property 
to other private owners because the municipality believes that will help the economic growth of that municipality. It's not even the state taking over like for a road, it's the state forcing one private owner to sell to another private owner in the overall interests of what the municipality believes to be the common good. That's how weak property rights could be even in America. So property rights are not absolute. Patents, the restrictions are much, much greater. The fundamental difference, and there's a fundamental difference between material property rights and intellectual property rights, and particularly patents of these. First of all, material property rights are clearly rivalrous, and as Stans point out, ideas are clearly non-rivalrous. Property you can exclude with a fence. Ideas, well, very hard to exclude. Secrets always come out in the end. Everyone believes that Coca-Cola is a secret formula. Everyone believes that Kentucky Fried Chicken is a secret formula. Rubbish. All the competitors know what the formulae are for Kentucky Fried Chicken and Coca-Cola. It's in everyone's interest to pretend. Pepsi can pretend that it's formula is secret, etc., etc., etc. There are no secrets. I'm coming on to this in a minute. But the other fundamental thing is this. No piece of knowledge in science exists alone. It's part of a chain of knowledge. A piece of land stands alone. End of story. But any idea you have is built on the thousand other ideas that people have had all the way back to Greek times, and you continue to produce ideas all the way forward. If you try to isolate a piece of intellectual property away from all the ideas before and the, all the ideas afterwards, it cannot be done. And if you try to protect an idea with intellectual property, you're creating something artificial. So, physical property stands alone, is non-rivalrous, and is, is rivalrous and is excludable. Intellectual property is part of a chain of knowledge, is rivalrous, and is not excludable, but the secrets always leak out. They are therefore hugely different. The incentives are different as well. The incentive of private property is that once you own it, because it's private, you will then invest in it. The incentive for intellectual property is that you won't invest in it unless you know that when you get it, you will then get a monopoly in it. Nothing wrong with wanting to monopolise. Nothing wrong with ownership. Without ownership, you won't invest. So I'm not criticising the concept of ownership. But what I'm saying is, the incentive is curious. Is it true that unless you are guaranteed a monopoly in your invention, you won't do research and development? And I, I hope to show in a minute that this is not true. But I'm going to try to present, present the arguments honestly and in a dispassionate way, rather than just give a... Uh, a biased talk. I mean, I just present the arguments as they are and, th and then come up with my own judgments. So what is the history of patents? Well, patents start off with a very murky, a very bad history. I'm talking about England now, which was one of the pioneers in patent law. Uh, before uh, the statute of monopolies, which I'm just about to come to, kings, bad kings, almost all the kings of England were bad kings, <laughs> uh, used to sell monopolies, patents they were called, to favoured courtiers. So people were given monopolies in soap, which wasn't very lucrative because the English didn't wash a lot in those days, but nonetheless, <laughs> or monopoly in salt, or monopoly in glass. And this was just a disgrace. That's all that that was. Um, and in the end, Parliament got so sick of this that in 1624, they forced on James I that thereafter, monopolies could be granted by the king. In those days, it was an executive authority by the king only for novelties, and the exact words were projects of new inventions, 1624. We all believe in England that our liberties, parliamentary uh, rule, separation of powers start with the glorious revolution of 1688, 1689. Actually, it's not true. 1688, 1689, which are very important for us, you probably haven't heard of them, but for us they seem very important, they only came around because people were trying to recover what they saw as the lost privileges of, of parliament and people. So as early as 1624, for example, Parliament was already restricting the power of the executive to give monopolies to established industries, only new industries. James I was a particularly bad king. He used, to have, he used to have forced loans, for example. He would go to people and say, you're rich, you're going to have to lend me some money. You have no choice in the matter. And by the way, if you think I'm going to pay it back, think again. That's how kings used to behave before 1688, and that's how they behaved with monopolies. However, in 1624, when a proper patent law starts in England, it's a gift of the, the crown. You have to pay the crown for it, but you are allowed a patent. It's called patent as in patently obvious or patent leather. It's a letter, but, it, but the seal at the bottom doesn't seal the letter. So as you know, in the olden days, you had a letter, and you close it down, you put a wax of seal, that was a closed letter. 
but a, a patent letter, you, you, had letter, you put a seal of wax and you didn't close it. That was the point. It was an open letter. The word patent means open. It was an open letter. So anyone could read it. And what the letter says is, this is my invention. I've told you what my invention is because I have to tell you or I can't tell you how to control it and it's now mine. Thanks to the king. And then what happened over the next hundred years is that Parliament increasingly took away from the executive the rights over this and made it increasingly subject to the rules of Parliament, such as, for example, full disclosure, which had to be published, and offices were set up, patents office and all the rest. So this became increasingly more and more like the modern law. English patent law started in such a sophisticated and effective way because it was based on Venetian patent law. The Venetians were the first to develop a really sophisticated patent law. And as early as 1474, the Venetians had an extremely sophisticated patent law. It was published, and the law was very modern. I mean, this is a long time ago. But patents were only given for inventions that were published. Uh, there were term limits of only 10 years. There were fines for infringements. A legal system was set up. Statutes were set up. Courts were set up. And the Venetians had a very sophisticated system of patent law. Why? Because Venice in particular was a center of glass making, which was international. An enormous concentration of glass makers in Venice, all competing with each other, and they lobbied perennially for these patent laws, which of course they got from the Venetian Republic. And then when Venice declined, and also when people started to find other areas of sand and all the rest of it, you need for glass, so Venetian glass makers moved, and so everyone started making glass and the Venetian glassmakers took with them their concepts of patent law, which are then used to see the rest of Europe, including, finally, England, at the very limits of Europe. England, of course, like the Netherlands, was then the most commercial country in Europe, uh, and so we were the one amongst the first to adopt these new patent laws from the Venetian Republic, which, of course, are very commercial. And so that's why our patent laws are born fully made and so perfect, because they're copied on the ancient Venetian laws. Although, actually, interestingly, the world's first patent that we know of was the patent given to Brunelleschi, the great Italian architect who built the dome in Florence. And in 1421, he was given a patent for a hoist he'd invented as a way of uh, lifting the stones um, up to the a dome he was building. And he was given a patent there uh, for three years for his new hoist. It is said that this may well be apocryphal. It is said that as long ago as 500 BC, the Greek city-state of Sybaris had annual cooking competitions. And the chef who won every year with the most interesting and innovative dish had the right to monopolize that dish in, in because you know, in those days, there was a very, very vigorous restaurant culture in classical times. People, you go to Pompeii, every other shop, if it's not a brothel, there's a restaurant. Um, they, uh, because people were frightened to cook at home because of the fire, so people liked to go to restaurants because it was a much safer way of cooking. Um, um, this is true. This is true. People did not like to cook at home because it was so dangerous. They, they would go to restaurants. So there was a very active restaurant culture in classical times. And uh, Cyprus had this annual competition. And the deal was the restaurateur came up with the best dish, had the right to monopolize it for a whole year until the following year. That is what is said. And so it may be that property rights go back a very, very long way. But the only one that we can be secure about is the Venetian one and the Brunelleschi one. And in England, of course, uh, we have, as I said, uh, the Statute of Monopolies. And then in 1710, we have this extending into copyright, the Statute of Anne. But copyright is what Stan knows about, so I'm going to go much more back to Paris. Now, there has become a sense of international standardness about patents, based largely on European conventions, American conventions, and now, of course, we have these international <coughs> conventions. But in simple terms, there are three types of patents. Uh, recognized generally across the world in terms of patent law. You've got utility patents, inventing some new thing. Uh, plant patents, developing a new plant, you know, the thing that grows in the soil. Uh, and new patent design patents. And conventionally these days, utility and plant patents you have for 20 years, and a design patent you're allowed to have for, uh, and a design patent for 14 years. These are, these are the conventions. And there are restrictions. Just as there are restrictions on property rights in land, so there are restrictions on patents. You can be granted a patent only if the invention is useful. If there's no use, then you can't have a patent in the judgment of the examiners in the patent office. It has to be new. If it's not new, you can't have a patent. 
And it has to be something that's non-obvious. The patent examiner says to him or herself, if I was just a typical person in this area, and these are the facts I really knew about, would this step be an obvious step, or would it be a non-obvious step? Because a non-obvious step is something that would require some research and development, and therefore justifies giving those sort of incentives. Those are the conventions. Now, as I said, as patents evolved, particularly in the early part of the 19th century, there was a huge global and international reaction against them. Basically, what people objected to was the fact that inventors had monopolized their invention when it was so obvious, it seemed to them, that society would be better off if everyone could copy as cheaply as possible. If I was a Chinese consumer, and this man here was selling the expensive cranes, I would think, good for the Japanese for selling a cheap crane. I would say that would be better for society, that he is undercut. That's what I would say about the Chinese consumer. And the question is, is the Chinese consumer right or wrong? Which I'm going to come to in a few minutes. Um, so what happened in the early part of the 19th century? As finally the Industrial Revolution spread from first Holland, of course, and then the French invaded the Netherlands, which destroyed their economy, for which we've always been very grateful in England. And then England took over with our Industrial Revolution, and then that became a, a, a European phenomenon. And suddenly, invention was everywhere. People were inventing railways and all sorts of things. And with their patents, suddenly people said, but are these patents in the interest of society or not? Why can't we get cheaper cranes? The copying would be so obviously in the interest of society. And the arguments put forward in the United States, very vigorous arguments, and very well described in this book, which I should just show you. This, this entertaining book is the only real study called Piracy by Adrian Johns. He's a professor of history of science at the University of Chicago. This is the only really good reference I've found. It's a good book, actually. Quite a good book. It could be shorter. But he <laughs> describes it. <laughs> He describes very well the extraordinary debates in Europe about suggesting that patents were not in the interest of society. Um, uh, and, of course I, 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 and some of the names opposed to patents, I mean, these are not trivial names. Apart from Bismarck, who's not a very famous inventor, we have men like Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the famous English engineer. But there were many, many, many. And the analogies were with free trade. You know, that was a time when the English were abolishing the Corn Wars. The English were abolishing tariffs. The English were embracing free trade. And just as they abolish tariffs, because tariffs are clearly in the interests of a privileged group of manufacturers and farmers, so it seemed that patents were an equally dishonorable monopoly in the interests of these evil people that we call inventors. And so um, that was part of the free trade movement. And the arguments were these. One, it's not true that inventors are particularly special people. Actually, simultaneous invention seems to be part of the deal. People are always inventing things at the same time. So why are we protecting invention when, it, you know, when the invent invention is commonplace? That was one of the arguments made at the time. Second, humans are spontaneously inventive. You don't have to, you don't have to foster invention. People always come up with new ideas. What is much rarer is the man or woman who can translate ideas which are cheap into useful products. Any fool can come up with a new idea. Can you run a factory? Can you run a marketing department? Can you organize a sales force? That's what's difficult. Ideas are two a penny. And therefore, by protecting ideas and allowing developer inventors to monopolize ideas, you're stopping the really important thing, which is the manufacturers from exploiting those ideas. So it was based on the concept at the time that ideas and invention was cheap and easy. It was development and industrialization that was difficult, required capital, required organization, all the rest of it. And as I said, this argument was sufficiently compelling. We in Britain were that way away from abolishing patents. The Swiss never had them until the Berne Convention was coming to that. The Dutch, as I said, actually abolished them. We were, we were that close to abolishing patents. And if we hadn't had a general election as it happened, well described in this book, on a particular year over a completely separate issue, if we hadn't had a general election at that point, that parliament would have abolished patents, and Britain would have abolished patents about 1852. But there was a general election, different group of politicians came in, impetus lost, blah, blah, blah. This is how things happen in politics. And because the arguments are so finely balanced, in the end, the British stayed with patents. As you'll hear from Stan, you know, the copyright 
you know, you see throughout the whole of the 19th century, the Americans never embraced copyright. The Europeans did, the Americans didn't. These, these were genuinely interesting debates, and the arguments are surprisingly modern, some of them. Not all of them, but some of them are surprisingly modern. In the end, by the way, the reason the Dutch and the Swiss developed patents was um, uh, public opinion. Uh, there was the Bern Convention, no, sorry, there was the Paris Convention of 1883, uh, which, where countries that did have patents came together and started to develop joint legislation, essentially. Um, that was the Paris Convention of 1883. Then you had the Berne Convention of 1886, where the same things of people integrating all their copyright laws. The, the, Ber the Paris and Berne Conventions then became the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is now, of course, part of the United Nations, World Trade Organization. We all know what these world organizations were. And in the end, what happened, if you, if you actually go into the literature, the Swiss and the Dutch, they just felt lonely. They were just out of it. You know, they were part of all these international clubs. No one was talking to them. And so they thought, well, we better join the club. So they joined the club. And even the Americans, in the end, signed up to the Berne Convention only 100 years later than everyone else. So you know, everyone likes to be part of the club in the final analysis, which is why copyright and international uh, protection are uh, fairly global activities now. But it's all about uh, popular demand, public opinion. There is surprisingly little analysis of whether it's actually good or not. Now, here is a brilliant book. This is a brilliant book, surprisingly little known. It's called Patent Failure, written by two American lawyers, Besson and Moira. They're both at the uh, University of Boston. One of them actually comes from an entrepreneurial background. And they have done, and they're right, in their own words, the first empirical study in 50 years as to whether patents are any good for society or not. What is extraordinary is they write so well, which is unusual. And they can think very well, which is less than <laughs> unusual. They point out the following problems with patents. The fundamental problem with patents is this. Patents are part of a chain of knowledge. That's the problem. You have a thousand inventions in a row, and you try to isolate that one. The trouble is that unlike a piece of land, and they've analyzed this, they are very deep thinkers. Unlike a piece of land which is completely appropriable, that's a piece of land, you don't know when you invent something who is then later going to invent something based on your original invention. And so you can end up with a patent which five years down the line can stop an entire discipline growing because you actually own the idea that almost no one could have predicted becomes someone else's basis of their industry. And so individuals can monopolize, it's called abstraction. You can abstract from a patent an entire discipline thereof. The other thing about patents, the other great problem, because it's this chain of knowledge, you can stop others from using your knowledge, but others can stop you using your knowledge. Just because you have a patent doesn't mean you're exploited. If I have a patent for um, the minute hand of this watch, and someone else has a patent for the hour hand, I can't make a watch with my minute hand, because he or she can stop me making a watch because they have the patent for the hour hand. Unlike a piece of land, if you own a piece of land, you own a piece of land. End of story. You can grow crops on it. But you can own half of this watch, and you can't make a watch for someone else. So you have the right to stop others from using your information, but others have the right to stop you using yours. So you don't have real property in the sense of property rights, because someone can stop you using your so-called property. But the real problem is this chain. No one knows of the patent where the boundaries are. Piece of land, you know where the boundaries are. With a patent, no one knows where the boundaries are. You know, what is actually going to happen three years down the line? What, you know, how much is your technology... If you buy something online today, you are potentially breaking 7,354 pounds. No one knows. And every day the numbers change. Because there are so many uh, software patents. So many patents. That it, no one knows who's breaking patents. So no one knows what the boundaries are. And abstraction. You can invent a patent, and then three years later, someone comes up with a different technology, and suddenly your patent's worth a million. What they have is this extraordinary graph on page 15. And what this graph shows, very simple terms, I'm, I'm just showing you, is that they calculate, using fairly conventional and fairly conservative calculations, what the benefits to America, it's an American book, but America now dominates the, these ideas, uh, what, the prof, what the benefits are to America, to America as a society, of patents in the pharmaceutical industry, the chemicals industry, and all other industries, compared to the cost of litigation. 
Well, in pharmaceuticals and chemicals, the benefits to society are huge and the cost of litigation relatively small. I.e. relatively few pharmaceutical and chemical patents are disputed and the cost therefore is small. But in the rest of the American economy, the cost of litigation are now <laughs> four times greater than the benefits that American society obtains in patents. You as an individual may be well out of a particular patent, but the cost of litigation in America today and the benefits to all patent holders collectively four to one. Patents are an enormous burden on the American economy now, outside chemicals and pharmaceuticals, because everyone knows what the structure of a chemical compound is. There it is. And everyone knows who published it first. There it is. So the problems of abstraction and boundaries are relatively limited. Either that's the formula or it's not. You know what it is. But in the rest of the world, you invent a new different way of a mouse, and you're using the technology of a thousand other people to make your mice, and another thousand people use your mice for their mice. No one knows where the boundaries are. You can abstract indefinitely. And they put the problem, and for lawyers, they are astonishingly brave. In 1982, the Americans invented a new court, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, specializing in patent law. And this court, like all other human organizations, is imperialist, expansionist, and monopolist. And it wants to make itself as important as possible. So all the patent cases go to this court, and they extend the <coughs> rights of patent owners as much as they can, so that their court becomes as important as possible. And so you only have to invent the most trivial thing, and this court will give you the rights over absolutely everything that's used it ever since, because they say that we must protect the moral incentive rights of the inventor, completely forgetting the implications, the damaging implications on the rest of society of expanding the power of the court. And every now and then it reverses its previous decisions to introduce just enough uncertainty to make sure no one knows where the law is so they then have to continuously go back to law. They don't, they don't believe in what's called black letter law. They believe in very grey letter law. So everyone's always having to litigate everything. And the only beneficiary are the judges. It's a very powerful and interesting book. So... <laughs> And the advocates um I'm sorry? And the advocates um, Of course. Yeah. Of course. We must protect the advocates. Now, I get to, because it's already five past eleven, now I started late, because, but, but still, I, I don't want to go on for too long. But let me just finally go from the best book of all, which is a book called Sex, Arts and Profits, written by, oh, Terence Pugh. And I have a chapter in there called Let's Abolish Patents, and I just finally want to summarise my arguments why patents uh, are a mistake and... Uh, um, the arguments are fundamentally these, that they incentivize research and that they promote disclosure. Both arguments are these. Imagine you are a software manufacturer or a drug company or really anything, and you're trying to make money in the market. And you decided that you weren't going to do research because you felt that the incentives that the government had given you weren't strong enough. No, the incentives aren't strong enough. I'm not going to do any research. I refuse to do research you'll go bust within the year. The incentive to do research is that your competitors are doing research. And if, they, and if you don't do research, you will go bust. And we know this because study after study after study has shown that the greatest incentive to do research is that competitors are doing research. It's obvious. And the thing about a monopoly is you can keep competitors out and you can therefore do less research. This man here with his crane company, I'm not being personal, you understand, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> He thought he had a monopoly. Ah, oh, there's our crane. We've got a monopoly. Ah, oh, I don't have to do any more research. And then, because there's no intellectual property in China, ha-ha, his monopoly was broken by the Japanese. If he knew he didn't have a monopoly, if he, because he was given a false, then he'd know that the only way to keep ahead of the Japanese was to do more research. So the incentive to do research is not the monopoly. The incentive to do research is the competition. And the incentive to do research is reduced by the patents because you think you have a monopoly. So the argument is completely wrong. If you want research, you have as much competition as possible. And actually, and all the evidence is overwhelming on this, the incentive to do research is what is called first mover advantage. If you're first in the market and you produce the next best product, the cheaper crane, you will then capture the market. And having captured the market, 
You then have enough money to invest in research for the next invention before the others catch up with you. The incentive is not the monopoly. The incentive is fear of competition. That's <coughs> Funnily enough, the man who described this very well was another German, Karl Marx. So I can explain that extraordinarily well. So the incentive to do research is competition, not monopoly. It's exactly the wrong argument. Couldn't be more wrong. The other thing that's completely wrong about patents is the argument that they promote disclosure. Ah, patents. Well, of course, you're forced to put it in the public domain. This is a complete misunderstanding of how science works. First of all, let me quote from an empirical study written by Edward, Edward Mansfield, the most distinguished American economist, published in 1981, survey of 100 firms in America. Information, this is an economic journal, a very distinguished journal. Information concerning development decisions is generally in the hands of rivals within about 12 to 18 months on average. And information containing the detailed nature and operation of a new product or process generally leaks out within a year. One of the big myths is that companies are secretive. Actually, the most successful companies are those who share most actively their research with their competitors. Imagine, if you like, three companies. Company A, Company B, and Company C. Company A and B agree to share their research. Company C refuses to share its research. Who's going to win? Well, Companies A and B now have access to twice as much research as Company C. So we don't know whether it's going to be A or B, but the one company you know will fail will be Company C. The more you share research, share, I don't mean give, I mean exchange, the more likely you are to succeed as a company. Why do scientists go to conferences? Why do scientists publish? Why, why do we do this? Because the scientists who share information, it's a form of trade, and I've written about this extensively in my book, because actually it's quite, quite cost of entry to science. But the scientists who publish and share, they'll obtain from other scientists information that then enables them to succeed. Whereas a scientist who sits in the middle of a forest and doesn't talk to anyone, is reduced only to their own resources, they'll always get overtaken. And we actually know this because you know, there have been scientists in this world who've gone to secret woods and published and run their factories in isolation. They always get defeated by those who involve themselves with competitors. And um, <coughs> listen, I'm not gonna, I, in my paper for you, I will, I will describe the references, but the references are very, very clear. The, the, the empirical evidence is very, very clear. Companies, successful companies, share information with their competitors. The trouble is this is illegal. One of the great problems is, is because antitrust law in America believes, this is somewhere where Germany is much more advanced than America. Uh, America, antitrust law, doesn't understand this. Really. What you need for a commercial optimum is companies A and B to absolutely compete when it comes to selling their products. Of course, at that point, you've got to have total competition. But you want total sharing of knowledge at the research level to maximize the knowledge base. And so what happens? Exactly as Edward Mansfield has described, successful companies share all their knowledge, a, a large amount of it, with their competitors. That's how the market actually works. Because the market is the company that should go bust. And so it's a complete myth that companies are secretive. Failed companies are secretive. Successful ones disclose everything. Because that's how they get information back against the less uh, open companies. In any case, as Mansfield goes on to show, uh, patent protection does not seem essential for the development and introduction of at least three quarters of innovations. That's to say, Mansfield did all these surveys, he died recently, he was the most distinguished, most distinguished economist, to show that some of that three quarters of innovations aren't even patented anyway, because it's not worth accounting. And I quote from another e e e economist, uh, Levin, uh, president, of course, at Yale, university presidents are particularly important people, I find. He quotes, the new processes Patents were generally rated the least effective of the mechanisms of appropriations by 650 separate companies. Lead time, first move advantage, learning curves and sales and, effort, sales and service efforts were much more effective than patents in protecting products. And indeed, spontaneously, you get this all the time. It's not just the patent pool of the American uh, aviation industry. Detroit, where the American car industry is based, there has been an informal exchange of have you noticed that General Motors never sues Chrysler? Why is that? They have a dog that doesn't bark at them. Well, the American car companies aren't fools. They understand the only way to do it, so they share all their knowledge at that level, and they don't sue each other. They patent everything, but actually they don't sue each other. They informally understand how it works. And so American car companies are never suing each other. It's curious how we never see the things that don't happen. Why do American car companies never sue each other? Because they're run by sensible men. 
and women. I'm not going to make a sexist point here. Um, and so, and, 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 and spontaneously this happens. You have all these consortia that are very, I, I write about them, they're in the paper, the SNP consortium, the Giga Sales Center. The only way these work under American antitrust laws, you have to have a charity there somewhere, a university department, a government department, around which all the private companies can then coalesce. But that's to get rid of the law. It's, it's actually fundamentally about um, uh, these private companies trying to find ways of getting around antitrust and to openly discuss. Otherwise, they, why are these all, what's the point of science parks? Yeah. Why do competitive companies, why do competitive companies congregate in the same science park? You know, what's that about? I mean, surely competitors want to be as far away from each other as possible. Well, of course, competitor companies congregate so they can talk to each other. The cartel, at least at that level, is a good thing. And so um, it's a myth that patents promote disclosure. Everyone always knows. The thing about patents, of course, and here I was going to talk, but I'm running out of time. It's a real shame that Michaela Bolton is not here. Is the evidence that they put forward in their fantastic book against intellectual property, which we printed out rapidly in their memory because he's not here tonight, um, is the, the, the evidence of the steam engine. But I'm running out of time, and uh, perhaps Sam's going to raise it up anyway. Um, patents are promoted by individual companies. As Adam Smith pointed out, men of the same trade seldom meet together, but the conversation turns into a conspiracy against the public. And people who run big companies think it's in their interests to have patents. As Karl Marx said, Mar um, industrialists do not seek to open markets, but to close them. Karl Marx made exactly the same observation that Adam Smith made. People are in it for self reasons, and of course, individual owners of patents want to maintain their patents, but it's not always in the interest of society. Um, I made a point there's a lot of empirical evidence that strengthening uh, intellectual property doesn't do anything for economic growth. In fact, it seems to go the other way around. And let me just point out some areas where patents have described economic development and then I could shut up. Ford invented the first mass motor car. He was patented to death by litigation from the American Association for Licensed Automobile Manufacturers. He finally defeated their patent, which is why we finally got the world's first cheap motor car. But before Ford broke their patents, motor cars were a privilege of the rich. Why, by the way, is the American um, film industry congregated in California? It's not, as everyone thinks, because of sunshine. In the days when the American film industry went to California, all so-called outside scenes in films were, were filmed inside. They went to California because it was the furthest point they could find in America from Edison who had patented the film industry, and every time anyone tried to make a film in New York State, Edison took them to court, like the um, Wright brothers. But out in California, in Hollywood, where they didn't have roads or electricity back in 1907, Edison's reach didn't reach there, and so the American uh, film industry is in California, because that's as far away from Edison as they could go. <laughs> so I'm going to stop now to say one more final thing about the value of invention. Um, uh, Astrebo, Astebro, Thomas Astrebo of the University of Toronto surveyed just over a thousand Canadian inventions that had been patented in 2003, pointed out that only 75 of them reached the market, of which 45 lost money. Patents are much, much less important than people realise. They're basically a form of monopolisation. Patent trolls are a particular problem. The cost of litigation hugely exceeds the benefits to society. And the only exception to this is pharmaceuticals. And the reason pharmaceuticals, by the way, is exception is very simple. Quite rightly, under modern legislation, having invented a new drug, you then have to spend almost a billion dollars now, billion euros, in health and safety. And it takes about 15 years. These are rough figures. Well, under those circumstances, you must have patent protection because the cost of copying are trivial from both. But that's because the government has huge, put, rightly put this huge regulatory burden, and therefore the government should give you a compensatory protection. Of course, it's not exactly a free market for pharmaceuticals. You need patents and pharmaceuticals, and the evidence is very strong. The tighter the intellectual protection, the more the pharmaceutical industry invests in R&D. No question. But it's only pharmaceuticals in which that's true, and that's because the government has distorted the market. But in a free market, you do not need intellectual property. You need the race to get there first, and if you're going to have intellectual property, you should either have patent pools, of which they're much more common, formal and formal than people realise, or like copyright, compulsory licensing. People should have the right to force you to license your patent technology to them at a reasonable price, so that you can have your property right, but you can't enforce it in ways that damage the economy. And if you therefore want to carry on beating the, the, the competitors, 
do some more research. Don't try to monopolize what you don't have the right to monopolize, because it's built on a thousand years of history, and it's part of a chain of knowledge, and it was never yours in the first place. Thank you very much. of patenting drugs. 